Hello, I'm so pleased to be with you today in introducing Breakouts, a 360 view of the year's breakout hits and how they were launched. You're in for a real treat. Our speakers today are going to provide you with the tips, tricks, and best practices for producing integrated campaigns that really break through in today's cluttered marketplace. So please welcome to the stage EVP Marketing and Digital, USA Network and Sci-Fi, Alexandra Shapiro. <laughs> EVP Marketing and Creative, Nickelodeon, Nick at Night, TV Land, Kim Rosenblum. Oh, in the house. <laughs> SVP, Marketing, Creative, and Brand Strategy, Lifetime, LMN, and FYI, Tim Nolan. <laughs> and your moderator, President, CEO, BPG, and the most stylish man in LA, <laughs> Steph Sabag. Hello everyone, I'm Steph Sabag, CEO of BPG, and um, BPG is, uh, specializes in 360 campaigns to launch TV shows. First of all, I want to thank our panel very much for taking their time to do this. We have a very exciting um, uh, session for you. So today we're going to take a complete 360 view on what it takes to launch a new show in today's environment. Um, we're going to look at three breakout hits um, in the past year. We're going to look at Mr. Robot from USA. Then we're going to look at Younger from TV Land and Unreal from Lifetime. <laughs> so how do you launch a new series in today's environment where 65% of broadcast ratings are now derived from live programming? Because Netflix and other OTT have really changed the way um, TV is viewed today. Today, a consumer could watch what they want, when they want to watch it, all the episodes right away, and commercial free. So the new challenge is, how do you launch a new show in that environment when your primary goal is to launch linear, sorry, is to drive linear L3 and L7 ratings? So you have to get consumers to watch um, within that very narrow window. So uh, the day of just uh, relying on your promo and key art is gone. So today you have to dig really deep to find an audience. You need an arsenal of high, high quality social content, influencers, activations, out of home ideas, stunts. You, ne you need to do things that have never been done before. Now more than ever you need to create an event. And this is what these guys have done with their shows. So first up, let's see how Alexandra Shapiro and the team at USA launched Mr. Robot. Great, thank you. So I'm just sort of gonna take you through a little bit of um, what this show became and uh, take you, sort of show you behind the curtain um, some of our thinking and how we decided to launch this. So first thing is, this was a very small show, it, or so it appeared in conceit, right? It was about a cybersecurity, anti-social cybersecurity programmer by day and a vigilante hacker by night. And the question is, is how did this show that looked like sort of this beautiful independent film go on to hack pop culture and truly become one of the undisputed hits of the year? It charmed the most jaded critics out of the gate, calling it brilliant and revolutionary, perfection sensational. It went on to garner, sort of sweep the awards, you know, winning Best Drama, Best Supporting Actor, it swept the Critics' Choice Awards. We just recently won the Peabody's, South by Southwest. And then it mesmerized influencers and fans alike. And so the question is, why? Why this show and not another show? And certainly it has something to do with its timely themes, right? Injustice and abuse of power, income inequality, online privacy, connected world, declining trust in institutions. If you look at this on paper, I could be, you know, this could be the, the platform for um, Bernie Sanders. Um, or on the other end, it could be, you know, Donald Trump. Um, but it's very of the moment. And all these things were in the cultural zeitgeist. But when you start to strip that back, and well, so I'm not you know, um, uh, delegitimizing that, but there's themes that come up, right? Power, revolution, equality, democracy. And all of these things, when you distill them down to their essence, is about authenticity. And this show was in its purest form, the most authentic form of storytelling, and the way the characters were rendered, and the way Sam Esmail, our showrunner, 
put the words on paper, the way he shot and curated every single scene. And it necessitated, from a marketing approach, an equally authentic campaign. One that sort of threw the old rule books, you know, the, the, the rules of yore out the door, right? Effed the rules. One that embodied the anti-establishment and anti-authority spirit of this show. And it required three things primarily. One, this had to be a campaign that was about the bottom up, not the top down. This needed to be about discovery, about enabling advocacy, and letting people spread the word about this. It had to be provocative in nature, and you can see this in our first um, teaser campaign that we, went, we put out, um, that we certainly made that statement. And then uh, third, is that, that it had to be authentic in its voice. And we decided very early on that absolutely everything we did, from the promos to the print to the social campaign, was going to be in our lead character, Elliot's voice, his persona. And I will tell you now, almost a year in, we very, very rarely ever veer from his voice. And here's, check out two spots to sort of explain how that manifested itself in promos. Sometimes I dream of saving the world, saving everyone from the invisible hand, the top 1% of the guys that play God without permission. And now I think they're following me. We email, we reply all, we sign up, we sign in, we post, we repost, we tweet, we like, we link, we friend, we unfriend, we follow, we tag, we hashtag, we lol, we tmi, we happy face, we comment, we heart, we say nothing. those spots, while it doesn't really reference what is happening in canon specifically, it was Elliot speaking to you, the audience, and luring you in with what he was saying and things that were resonating in society. But even more of a challenge for a network called USA that had spent the last decade cultivating sort of blue skies about white people to whom nothing bad ever happens, um, <laughs> to suddenly launch a show like Mr. Robot was a Herculean effort. And we had to do two things. One, we had to literally put the show first and our brand and our network second. So in order to seed curiosity when we launched this, we started first with a mysterious, unbranded 10-second spot. This went on our air. It went out socially through dark posts. It had no reference to USA. It didn't even reference that this was a TV show to enlist people to go to this URL. This took them to a cryptic website called whoismrrobot.com. Again, totally void of branding, only the voice of our, the spirit and the hacker voice of our lead character, Elliot and Mr. Robot and F Society. And in within the first 10 second spot, we accrued 25,000 emails in less than 24 hours. And we went on to accrue multiple hundreds of thousands of emails for a CRM sort of push marketing campaign, at which point throughout the entire season, we would go and push message to these people. Again, messages that were in canon from his perspective and his point of view about the world. And then from a social perspective, is we decided all of our handles would embody, again, Elliot's voice and his defiant spirit. And so that any time you go on any of our handles, whether it's Facebook and Twitter, Snapchat and the like, but especially on those two primary platforms, we are responding and engaging with our audiences in real time. Many a person, because of our name, Mr. Robot, thought it was a bot and test us all the time, but it's not. These are humans on the ground who are then responding to people's sentiment and making them feel like they're part of a larger revolution. And we actually sent out 10,000 customized tweets over the course of the first campaign. And then lastly, again, so that we put our brand to the side, is we knew that we couldn't put out, start to do marketing where we were like telling people to come and watch it on us. That was going to be a recipe for disaster. So we truly had to democratize access. And we started this by almost in a political campaign, cultivating fandom, one group at a time, slowly, hopefully scaling them, and creating advocacy that hopefully had ultimately a, a, a domino effect. So it started off in the early access, these tastemakers and uh, collecting laurels. So we went to South by Southwest, Tribeca. We went to tech meetups. We went and had screenings at Google for 25,000 employees, Twitter and Facebook. Um, and then on May 27th, I think it is, so about five weeks before our linear premiere, we treat, treated our pre-linear like it was the official launch. 
We had our reviews go out at the time, and we literally democratized access. To the chagrin of our ad community, we took the uh, commercial-free asset, we put it everywhere, unprecedented, and put money against it. So Facebook, we, we streamed it on Twitch. 250,000 people watched it concurrently and then went on to have a live chat following. Um, it was on, uh, you know, uh, uh, everyone from Hollywood Reporter to, um, we put it on Twitter, it was on YouTube and the like. One of the largest prelinears. Now everyone's gone on and done this to great success. But we accrued 3 million views in, the, in, uh, you know, in very short order. It allowed us to change the conversation from being a quantitative assessment to a qualitative one. We knew we had a hit. We picked it up before we, any linear broadcast premiere, and it started an auction in the SVOD space. And then we went wide with it, of course, with a big broad campaign, accruing 30 now, 30 million people and counting. Um, and it just debuted on Amazon Prime last week. So I want to show you quickly um, a summary of what all this uh, meant. Edgy hacker drama Mr. Robot is a dark and complex thriller, different in tone and content than any previous USA Network show. With a provocative campaign that challenged traditional marketing methods and disrupted conventional distribution, USA set out to make Mr. Robot the breakthrough show of the year. Mr. Robot was first introduced to the world through a mysterious 10-second spot that drove curious viewers to an enigmatic website without branding or ads. Just one intriguing question, who is Mr. Robot? To slowly begin answering that question, timely content updates were released in response to real-world events, supported by a steady stream of compelling social posts and cryptic emails, all in the distinct voice and revolutionary spirit of Mr. Robot. Inserting Mr. Robot into cultural conversations created a sense of camaraderie that drove unprecedented fan engagement. As Mr. Robot fever spread online, USA took the show into the real world at South by Southwest. To support the world premiere screening, an army of brand ambassadors took over the streets of Austin. Mr. Robot himself hacked the official South by Southwest app, enhancing attendees' experience with free food, t-shirts, and other prizes. Mr. Robot won over fans, taking home the coveted audience award. In addition to screenings at Comic-Con and film festivals, USA tapped into young, tech-savvy crowds at college campuses and tech meetups across the country building an impassioned group of early adopters. It didn't stop there. USA partnered with every key media outlet to get the pilot out to the masses. Over three million people watched the first episode of Mr. Robot before its television debut, making a hit by amassing rave reviews, extensive buzz, and devoted fanatics. As the show approached premiere, USA's dynamic out-of-home campaign boldly embodied Mr. Robot's tenets of revolution and change. Graffiti art appeared around New York City, immersing fans in the blur of Mr. Robot's existence. With a little help from Mr. Robot's hacker collective, F-Society, USA partnered with the highly popular E3 Gamer Convention and hacked into Twitch TV's live stream. Viewers were given exclusive codes for hundreds of cash payouts, totaling $100,000, leading to over 1.5 million video views in three days. Next, fans were encouraged to join F-Society themselves. They could compete online challenges to test their skills, take over billboards in Times Square, and flood social media with personalized graphics in support of the collective. So how did USA make the best show of the year, the biggest show of the year? By launching a mysterious, unbranded site that amassed over 5 million engagements and over 100,000 subscribers. By fostering and maintaining exceptional social engagement. By granting unprecedented early access to the pilot and building a fanaticism that led to 23 million video samples. And by bringing the show's timely themes to life, Mr. Robot awoke the masses with the most compelling and relevant campaign of the year, with fans already clamoring for season two. Amazing campaign, love the social, love the activations, really uh, innovative. What would you say was the uh, most important thing that you guys did that really uh, made a difference this time around? Uh, I, I think mostly that we weren't afraid to take risks. I mean, I, I can't emphasize, this was very much part of our brand evolution. We had evolved our brand filter um, from a development perspective. We hadn't sort of announced our new sort of brand expression of this. But we weren't quite sure that the world and our audience was ready for it. And so I think we went out and thinking, listen, this is going to be the sort of our the sort of the first inning of a, of a nine sort of a nine inning game. But 
Um, and it, I think this surprised all of us, but part of that is that we thought, what do we have to lose? And so the, the not being afraid of trying to do different things, I think is what ultimately um, served this property well. And what came first, the, the rebrand or, or the show? Did the, the show, show drove the rebrand or did the rebrand um, drive the show? The brand filter had come before the show, but uh, we weren't naive enough to know, to think that we, we needed to have success behind, behind us before we could you know, have an outwardly facing consumer expression of it. But I would say this is the best embodiment of it. And how was uh, the showrunner Sam Ismay to work with on this? Um, well, Sam is, uh, I would say he's the, a modern renaissance man. He writes almost every episode. He directs every episode. Uh, he CDs campaigns. He did not CD this one, but he will CD the second one. Um, the, the, the main star was actually his girlfriend or fiance, Emmy Rossum, found him. Yes, right? she yeah. found him. Right. Um, he's extraordinary. I mean, he's a, he's a creative genius. And he comes from this world. So he was in production for a very long time before he got into this. And so he has a, I think, a, you know, a great sense of what is happening in pop culture, and he's almost prescient in his storytelling. Almost everything that happened in, you know, from the Ashley Madison hack to the unfortunate you know, shooting on, on TV in Virginia, uh, all of that actually, before it ever happened, was in his scripts. Um, and you know, I think that sort of, again, created this eerily um, resonant and timely show. And uh, 30 million views for that first uh, episode, right? And then, and then three million, but we've had 30 million since, people sample since, this, got it. yeah, and counting. Got yeah, it, got it. Okay, very good. 30 million. That would have been great. It was extraordinary. Through all those platforms. <laughs> um, great. Well, thank you, yeah. and uh, we will move on to Kim Rosenblum, who will uh, take us through younger. Great. Thank you. Here, I'll take the clicker. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I guess I should ask who's seen younger, because I do have a spoiler. So you all have, you have to go watch it this weekend immediately um, because the spoiler only spoils season one, not season two. But it's important, otherwise I wouldn't say it. Um, so I'm going to talk about Younger uh, and actually the marketing of both seasons one and two and what has you know, made it a breakout hit and sort of a, a beacon for a rebrand of TV Land. But first, a little history lesson. TV Land uh, is a, was launched as a classic TV network, you know, a spin-off from Nick at Night. And it was really a well-branded network that uh, was extremely well-known for reruns and was a declining business. Because in the world of DVDs and then SVOD and then Hulu, like no one was coming to us to watch reruns any longer. So at the end of last decade, we got into original programming. And we dabbled a little bit and we quickly found this formula that worked pretty well for the TV Land brand, which was this three camera, four camera sitcom on a stage with familiar faces. Uh, Hot in Cleveland was really the poster child for it. Uh, it was a real hit. It was 124 episodes. It went into syndication. You know, it was really very successful. Um, but it also meant that TV Land was really well known as the Betty White Network, uh, <laughs> which was fun and great. And Betty White's an amazing person to be associated with, but it wasn't great for our business. Um, because we started to see decline in ratings and we looked to develop new single camera shows and we got really lucky because we had this uh, relationship with Darren Starr who's the creator of Sex and the City and he um, brought this show Younger to TV Land. So um, what happened right around the time we were about to launch uh, Younger was there was a big shift in our demographic. So TV Land being an adult 25 to 54 network was always basically talking to baby boomers. And as that shift was always happening, officially in 2014, the majority of the audience uh, the, for the sales demo was no longer baby boomer, they were Gen Xers. And the reason I think that was really significant, and there's probably a lot of Gen Xers in the room, is that that's a very different person and a very different mentality than a baby boomer. Um, they're the very first MTV generation, they're the key latch kids. They grew up watching Married with Children, not Leave it to Beaver. And they were really uh, very strongly anti-formula. They are the people who were most affected by the economic meltdown. They're the people who are raising kids and aging parents. And they basically said, you know, throwback stuff, happy endings, formulas, like not for me, not at all interested. It really doesn't speak to me. So suddenly we were like trying to make this shift and we realized we had a big problem, not only with TV Land, this core brand, but also uh, with an, the audience we were trying to attract was essentially rejecting the concept of TV land. 
So um, at the same time that was happening, we had this study that kind of confirmed what I think we all knew was happening as social media was rising up, and that's that TV advertising, or you know, advertising and advertising on TV was no longer the number one way to drive people to discover content. Uh, it had tipped, and in fact, um, we were surprised to find out that not only do people not want to show up um, until they hear about it from a friend, they're worried about showing up. They actually need multiple validations, and I'm sure you all agree, you want to hear this show is great before you commit your time to it, because you are way too busy and your time is too precious. Um, so, you know, wasting my time became a big concern. And this was all, this information was coming to us right when we were about to launch Younger. So we made um, some pretty, uh, I think, significant decisions at the time that led to three big decisions that really changed the course for the marketing of Younger. And the first, very similar to what Alexandra said, was we actually removed the logo from the ad. We actually retracted the ad that had been already released, and we took off the network logo, and we replaced it with a type treatment. Um, because we really felt like the retro logo we had wasn't speaking to the content and wasn't speaking to the audience, and we didn't have our rebrand in place yet. Um, we also uh, changed our media plan, I mean, sorry, our premiere date. We uh, pushed it back two and a half months, and we had already released to press, and we had already been ready to go, and we had actually already bought media against January 13th. Um, and we decided to do that because all the episodes weren't done yet. They were still in production and it was going to be a rolling delivery. And we thought, you know what, this is a really good show. And it's going to stand a better chance if we can get the entire season in a kit out to um, press and out to critics and let them see the whole thing and measure it on all 10 episodes, not on a screener or two, and that we felt you know, that was worth it. So out of that, we had to rewrite our media plan um, and sort of figure out you know, how we would uh, make our dollars go a little differently. And then that was you know, sort of the, the third big idea, which we decided that it wasn't about premiere at all. The premiere didn't matter to us. What mattered to us is that we grew, that people did tell each other this was worth their time, and that people did come and show up, and that we would continue to feel some momentum. In fact, we gave our media plan a nickname. It's true, we called it hashtag snowball. <laughs> um, everybody who worked on it, we rallied around this idea of creating a snowball. And every decision we made was like, how does that affect the snowball? Does that help the snowball? Do we keep building and going and getting bigger? Um, and here's a tape we put together that uh, actually kind of sums up all the tactics. TV Land's original series, Younger, was a hit before it ever hit the air. Show of hands, how many of you would tune in for a second episode? Viewers and early focus groups said they couldn't wait to see more. But would they actually seek out the show? And would they watch it on TV Land, a brand known for reruns and original sitcoms with a retro vibe? All I keep hearing is younger, younger, younger. TV Land's custom research on viewing habits revealed that getting our target to tune in would require a combination of ads and word of mouth. The shows viewers get excited to watch are the shows people are talking about. Younger, with its soapy plot and pilot's cliffhanger ending, was definitely buzzworthy. Our strategy? Build awareness, enable sampling, then foster growth. Our marketing plan? Hashtag snowball. Leading up to the premiere, we worked every angle. Creator Darren Starr's Sex in the City cred. Star Sutton Foster's existing fan base. We hope you'll continue supporting live theater and that you'll watch us in Younger. And for Hillary Duff's legions of fans, we created a custom music video combining a peak of the show with her yet-to-be-released single. We aligned with the Oscars, the Golden Globes, Fifty Shades of Grey, and the fashion set. Through press and paid media, we hit the tastemakers and our target at every opportunity. Let's talk about Younger. 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 Don't miss our new series, Younger. Cheers. And since the best way to sell the show is the show, we put it out there. We screened it for buzzmakers, threw a thousand younger house parties, and previewed the pilot on multiple platforms. The media plan was designed to own the bookends of our target viewer's day, hitting her at strategic times to remind her about Younger, get her talking about it throughout the day, and thinking about it at home that night. <gasps> oh my God. What? Don't you wax. Oh, it looks like my mother's. The show premiered with back-to-back -back episodes on TV Land, Nick at Night, and Nick Mom. The stage was set. Next came the hard part, waiting and listening for our snowball to start an avalanche. 
I love the concept. This concept is such a good role. This show is so cute. Oh, TV Land show. The Young Girl is TV Land's newest success. I love it already. As the buzz began to build, we amplified it and made it easy for viewers to catch up and tune in. We fueled the fire on social media, leading to triple digit increases of followers on Instagram and likes on Facebook. It's totally gone viral. The younger premiere ranked in the top five Nielsen Twitter TV ratings and trended nationally. No way, trending? That's good, right? With a massive campaign on Pinterest, we created 56 boards, gained over 60,000 repins, and grew to over 280,000 views each day, engaging fans with fashion, wisdom, humor, and Nico. <laughs> the series continued to air across Viacom networks. We extended the media spend as long as possible, through week four and back for the finale, the most watched episode of the series. Younger has grown more than any other TV Land original ever, with adults, with women on every platform. TVLand.com, VOD, Hulu, and 29 million unique views on Linear. Well, hiya, bitches! Hi. So, will people watch a new and unexpected original series on TV Land? Yes, and hell yes. Younger brought in new viewers with a median age seven years younger and a median household income 21,000 higher than Channel Prime. We're keeping the snowball rolling by encouraging fans to spread the word, share with friends, and help grow the audience even more in season two. Younger is fresh, funny, edgy, sexy, and irresistible. Younger is the new TV land. Yay! And we're just getting started. So that worked, uh, and that felt really good. And you know, since you brought up in the beginning, Steph, that this is, you know, we're trying to get people to watch in live three. You know, we we were keeping an eye on the ratings, and I know it's challenging, but I think you have to look at the ratings. That is what we're measured on, and that is how we monetize. So, um, but you know, we really saw season one as marketing in many ways for season two, and we very very quickly turned around creative. Uh, we picked up season two, and I think we were like three episodes into season one. So uh, we did focus groups with fans because we knew that they were our evangelists and we needed them to come back and bring more. And this is the spoiler part. Liza gives up her secret at the end of the season. And what we heard from our fans was, oh my God, please tell me it keeps going. It can't be over, this can't be the end. Josh has to come back. Like they wanted more, more, more. They were very, very worried that it was done. So. Um, we you know, developed the advertising to make sure they knew that it was gonna keep going, that the stakes were even higher. Um, and we set pretty straightforward goals, which was to bring back the season one viewers, and then to expand that base. Basically, everybody had to bring two friends and to keep the momentum going. And now that we were rebranded, we actually did a rebrand you know, months after this premiered. We had a couple new originals beyond Younger. Uh, we wanted to keep Younger really now, instead of being shy about what the brand was, we were gonna put the brand more forward. Um, we engaged with fans every single day on every platform. We didn't act like it was off season ever. Um, we asked them to share. We just kept telling them to like bring their friends along and you know, give the gift of Younger, gave out iTunes gift cards, whatever we could do. Um, and then one weekend, I was looking at my social and this uh, thing came up from Adweek about voting for the hottest new series and I saw Younger was listed as a choice. And so uh, we went out, our social team went out and started asking our fans to vote. And as you can see, we won uh, by a lot. Um, and it was really just... Send that out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, we knew we weren't going to win the Peabody, right? We knew that wasn't going to happen. And that we Sorry. needed to show some credibility and we felt like fandom and winning something like Hottest New Series would do that for us. So winning that was a real goal and we did. Uh, we also did creative ideas that we thought would just get a lot of buzz. We had Hilary Duff uh, cover the Fleetwood Mac song Little Lies, which is perfect for the theme of the show. and. You know, we recorded the session, you know, we released it on iTunes. So I think what was important then in the next spot you'll see, which was the launch spot for season two, is that we kind of combined all these things. We took all the quotes from fans, we took that ad week poll, we took this music, and then we also made sure the fans knew that the storyline was gonna continue. So that was all of the pieces that went into making that one TV spot, which is here. 
crazy thing is, my life just got interesting, and I can't even talk about it. If I could turn the page in time, then I'd rearrange just a day or two. Let's give it a try, give it a try. Acclaimed by critics, adored by fans, TV's hottest new series is back. Younger, one-hour premiere, Wednesday at 10 on TV Land. So we also really invested in on-demand in the off-season. We spent money to get to drive to on-demand, and as we got closer to the season two premiere, we really pushed it. And as you can see, the last date is the day before we premiered, uh, where we peaked. Um, we used other tactics that we thought would get us attention, including sending um, press a binge basket over Thanksgiving with the season in case they hadn't watched it, like with a hot chocolate and you know, just you know, kind of a, f a fun thing. Uh, we actually had never had an app, so we released the app um, between Christmas and New Year's, which sounds like a really bad time to release an app, but it was actually a great time because there's not a lot going on with Apple and they gave it a lot of promotion and we put the full season up there unlocked so anybody could watch it. Um, and then we just did fun ideas and uh, the Josh calendar was um, <laughs> loved by fans. So. so okay, can we have to we have to move on to Tim? Oh, but, okay. Uh, I'll, I have, go wrap I'll, up I'll just fast. give you one quick question, and oh. we'll go on to Tim. Wait, um, can I just show off? Sure, sure, okay. hurry, go ahead. Because <laughs> you set goals and you want to show you achieve them. We did have growth, and you can see at the end that uh, the finale of season two ended higher than the uh, premiere of, of the season, and overall grew, I think, forty percent from season one. Yes, nice, so. amazing. Thank you. Great job. Um, so just really quickly, um, just thought it was interesting. So the season one of, uh, of Younger, the first four episodes were available on Hulu, um, and then, and then yeah. not the day after. Can you just talk about, do you think that helped the audience or, or not in your opinion? You know, we, it was on Hulu the day after because we really wanted people to discover it. And then um, the, there was a feeling that we were hurting our own L7 and that we should pull it back, so we did. And I was worried. I really was worried, and, but I was wrong because you saw the growth continue. And what we found is that we had enough fans and we kept people going. And then we've not been on Hulu, we've had no SVOD in between, so instead we've been pushing on demand and pushing the app. And I think, I don't know if it's hurt us, um, it, I don't know if that it hurt us, it's, you'll never know. But I do think the idea of being homegrown and fan driven um, you know, was more important than just being connected to Hulu. Great. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, so now the amazing breakout hit Unreal and here's Tim Nolan. Thank you. Hey guys, how are you? Um, so question, so who in the room has heard of Unreal? And who in the room was surprised that it was on Lifetime? So uh, when I first, one of the reasons I came to work for Lifetime um, I had been working on the History Channel for a long time. Uh, Nancy Dubuque, who hired me, said, we're going to make a huge investment in Scripted. And um, I'm happy that I'm here and that this paid off because there's kind of few times in your career that you get these defining moments to work on shows like this. So somebody recently asked me, um, who, who are you making this show for? Who are you marketing this show to? Um, and my answer to them was, we're making the show for the brand. We're not making the show for an audience. So a little bit different. Um, I think that the company, and if you've known Lifetime and the history of Lifetime, we were our movie network for 30 years. <laughs> and you know the kinds of movies, the Women in Peril movies. We're not shying away from it. So you know we're doing a lot of work to try to convert that brand. And you have a show like this, and that's what does it. So while we're focused on ratings and everything like that, we really did this show as a brand conversion. Um, Sarah Shapiro is the showrunner. She worked in. Um, a bachelor, bachelor type show. <laughs> um, and this is actually her story. So sorry if anyone works at the Bachelor Bachelorette, it's not the, <laughs> no offense. So I thought I'd take some time and just highlight a few key things that we did between season one and season two from the shows. Pardon me. So first of all, we did learn a few things um, as we moved through the campaigns. Um, we really felt passionate, especially with a network like Lifetime. You can go out there and say this is the greatest show in the world, but it's really the fans, the influencers that are really going to sell the show for you. Um, in season one, we had a big controversy. Do we sell the show to 
reality viewers as the behind the scenes of a reality show, and do we sell it to drama viewers as, as a drama show? Um, and we spent a lot of time trying to figure that out. And in season two, it's a drama with two key characters, Quinn and Rachel, and we're just selling it as a drama. We did find out that reality viewers, you know, and Bachelor and Bachelorette viewers do watch the show, but they're the people that also like dramas. Um, you know, it, it was all about the fans and the fans pushing the show. Um, so a few things we did was um, we partnered with BuzzFeed, love BuzzFeed, they're great. Um, BuzzFeed did their own content and they did a little series called Reality vs. Reality where they shot, uh, you know, people in their home recreating real reality moments. Um, what was interesting there was that we had a goal to hit 1.5 million in two weeks. We hit 3 million in 24 hours um, and that was really amazing. So BuzzFeed's a great partner. Um, the other thing that we did with uh, Jimmy Kimmel was we, um, and I can play the tape, but you know, we did a little stunt with Guillermo. You've seen them do it. Um, it was a great partnership here. Where we lucked out was it, it aired right after basketball, so it had a huge audience and the, and the rating was live. So go ahead and play that video. Uh, Unreal is a new Lifetime series about what really goes on behind the scenes of reality television. To give you an idea of how that goes, we let two of the stars of the show, Sherry Appleby and Constance Zimmer, pull a behind-the-scenes prank on our own little reality star, whose name is Guillermo. Hi, I'm Sherry. And I'm Constance. Uh, Guillermo thinks he's leaving work, but he's actually in for a very soggy surprise. Oh, oh, here he comes, here oh, he comes. Oh, here he comes. Oh, oh, hey, water! Water! <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God! Oh, my God! had a lot of fun doing that water bucket prank. Uh, but just like our show Unreal, a lot more goes into what you saw than what you might think. What you just saw was the end result of 16 months of hard work. I don't want to be stuck in here for another week, okay? What do we have? First, we had to come up with the idea for the prank. Oh, come on, you guys. A banana and a tailpipe? Give me a break. Mm, this is probably dumb, but I heard him say something about how he's afraid of water. No, I think that's, that's, that's actually pretty good. Let's use that. The best pranks prey on people's fear. So we're gonna do a water bucket prank. We came up with the idea and now all we had to do was execute it. We created pre-visualizations with the top graphic artists in the industry. We worked for three weeks rehearsing just to get the timing right. And it all finally came together to create the timeless prank that millions now love. Watch Lifetime's new series, Unreal, on Mondays to see everyone get exposed. Go to MyLifetime.com to find exclusive Unreal content. We'll be right back with Emmanuel Shariki. Thank you. Um, so like Kim, uh, I have to give a special shout out to Hulu. Um, no better partner. And when you think about what's going on with Scripted these days, when you think about the, the behavior that's there, we're all suffering from it. You really got to partner with somebody who's going to binge, right? Who, like, the behavior is there. They go to somebody like Hulu, um, and that's where people go to binge shows. So we uh, launched season one on Hulu in February. Um, the numbers were great. They were very strong. It was the completion rate that um, they were surprised by. And, you know, Jenny Wall, if you don't know her, is amazing. Great partner. Also shared some data with us um, and helped us figure out how we were going to strategically launch season two. Um, so uh, we did some partnerships with um, some endorsements like Vulture, um, I don't have my glasses on, but, uh, and we created these recaps for the shows where people actually created their own, the, the outlets created their own recaps. So I think it was another interesting way in, again, letting the natural people sell the show instead of us. So go ahead and play the video. Hey guys, Siobhan here. I'm so excited Lifetime's Unreal is back for season two, starting June 6th. So today, I'm gonna catch you up on season one, the way I see it. No, the way I see it. Whatever, you're an idiot. <laughs> so, um, a big part of season two, our strategy again, letting the fans sell the show, we sent influencers to the set. You know, we really, we tried to get influencers there every week, um, but we got them there for a week, uh, created a bunch of content, I think one of the influencers has like 25 million followers. Um, the other two had about 10 million followers together. So it's pretty amazing. Um, when you have talent like Sherry and Constance, obviously what they did with Guillermo, but you got, you know, when you have this talent that'll do anything for you and work tirelessly, it's just amazing. So uh, we have a short video to show that. There is no way you could ever get me to be on this show. Girl, you sure? Okay, maybe I'll think about it. Okay. 
Listen, I'm sorry. Um, things just aren't working out. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, let's get you out of here. I'm so sorry that your cat just died. <gasps> what? Tito? Yeah, Tito. I'm so sorry. so sorry. Okay, wait a minute. I see what you guys did there. It's very clever. Uh, Tito actually died. He's dead. Okay. <laughs> oh, my little Tito. <laughs> So, um, and, to, and to the promos at the end. So, you know, um, we're very proud of the show. We're very proud of, we got a Peabody Award for the show. If you told me three years ago that Lifetime would be getting a Peabody, I would have never guessed it. Um, something else that we did was that we uh, launched, uh, we announced that we were launching season three before we rolled out season two. Pretty amazing. So the company, the, the, everyone's so behind the show, so confident in the show. Um, and I have a couple of trailers that Valerie Albanese and her team did, um, which I think are pretty clever. So the, the first one is really just selling. The critical appra uh, praise for the show was amazing. Uh, our PR department sent out a book of it um, the other day. And I've never seen so much praise for a show, um, so, much, so many people behind the show. So we wanted to capture that in a, in a very creative spot. So play the first one. Money, dick, power. We, um, we actually made some key art, um, or my team made some key art with money, dick, power, and then sent me into the CEO to sell that through. So I am uh, <laughs> lucky I'm still sitting here today. Uh, but, um, so the second spot that started to play was um, Faith is a character in the first season of Unreal. So what they did was they did a, a breakout short form series with her, eight episodes. They were about three to four minutes each. Faith is, uh, she's a lesbian in the show. Um, so her character in the breakout in the short form series is that she plays a lesbian with her girlfriend and she goes to LA because she gets a spot on a Levi's commercial. Um, and so I have a little sample of, of her with her girlfriend in the bar. Um, no one knows that she's gay and, and the actor that she's working with is kind of conceited. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> there you go, cutie. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Sterling Cole. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> cool. Now, uh, take a picture. Yeah. Take a picture. Oh, you do it, your arm. Oh, no, no, no. See, if I'm holding the camera, it makes me a loser. What? <laughs> Whoever's holding the phone and the selfie's the one who wanted to take a picture. Kind of like a loser. Oh. I think we can both agree you a loser here. No offense. You know what? You don't have to be a whole butthole about it. But you do know the only reason I'm doing this is because you accidentally have 50,000 Christian followers, right? I didn't get back in good with you to the Lord because, well, they're the only ones dumb enough to steal my CDs. We like CDs. We love CDs. Exactly. How about, how about we just get uh, Amy to take the photograph? Yeah, that works. Okay. It's all right that I'm taller than you, right, honey? Yeah. The boots, it's the boots. Yeah, sure, it's the boots, not the. Look, we dead. I'm done here. So, the last piece of creative I want to share with you is you know, a, a key theme of the show is obviously Quinn and Rachel are these masterminds behind the scenes manipulating all these women in the show to do crazy things. So manipulation was a key theme. Um, not an easy theme when you're trying to figure out how to market a show, like how do you play that out? You know, what's the creative that's gonna fit with that? So these two spots, um, I wish I could say I did them, but the team did them. Um, Lindsay and Karen Griffin-Hagen and Valerie, they, they're, really, they're really great and it just really gets at the heart of First of all, how fucked up Quinn and Rachel are in the show, but at the, at the manipulation, so play the tapes. They say all is fair in love and war. I don't believe in war, but I do think love is like a rose. It just needs to blossom, and it will cut you if you're not careful. That all is fair, cut you. cut you. Careful? If you're not careful, I will cut you. That's how you get a second season. Uh. This house is full of amazing women. 
There's no backstabbing, nobody's calling each other liars. We all feel blessed, especially me. No one has backstabbing liar, liars, blessed. This house is full of backstabbing liars, especially me. Damn, we're good. Yes, we are. We are out of time, but really quickly, how did, uh, how did season two do? Season two? Yeah. Uh, it did shit in the linear airing, and it uh, jumped 133% um, in the C3. Very so. nice. And just last quick question, your favorite campaign in the past year that's not on your network? I like their campaigns. All right, that's a good one. Um, no, I'm not answering that question. Instead, I'm saying thank you to everyone who worked on the younger campaign who's here today. It was an awesome, awesome uh, team effort, and we love you. I love you all. And you're off the hook, are you on? No, 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 I have, I think that uh, I love Younger, both the shows. I think that the Emmy campaign for Mr. Robot is something to be jealous of. I think the Fuck Society was amazing. And currently, right now, I think Animal Kingdom, uh, you know, I don't know why naked men are showing up on my Facebook feed, but uh, no clue on that. But I think they're doing a great job, and uh, that's out there. So right. congratulations. And thank you guys for doing this. Thank, thank you, everybody.